hallelujah. Come on, say a hallelujah. Come on, lift up the highest praise to God. He's so deserving. Come on, say hallelujah. Come on, God, woke you up this morning. Say thank you, Jesus. Come on, he's kept you all week. Say thank you, God, for keeping me. Come on, he's deserving of every praise. He's deserving of every honor. Come on, just come on now. Don't be ashamed to praise God. Come on, put those hands together. Come on, praise him. Come on, lift your hands and surrender. Say, God, I love you. God, I worship you. God, I love you. God, I adore you. God, I'm so grateful for what you've done for me. I'm grateful for how you've kept my family. Hallelujah, God, I thank you that I'm in my right mind. I thank you, God, I have activity of my limbs. Come on, give God some praise in this place. Come on, lift up a praise in this place. Come on, lift up a praise in this place. Lift up a praise in this place. Come on, welcome this Holy Spirit. Welcome this Holy Spirit. Welcome him into this place. Hallelujah. He's so worthy. Hallelujah. God, we honor you. God, we worship you. God, I lift my hands of surrender. And God, I ask you, God, to have your way in my heart. Have your way in my life. Have your way in this place. Touch hearts, touch minds, oh God. And we welcome you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Uh. Welcome into this place. Welcome into You desire to abide in the praises of your people, so we lift our hands as we lift our hearts as we offer up this praise unto your.
all across this building. Come on, keep that attitude of praise. Come on, can I get about 50 of you guys to put your Holy Ghost hands together? Come on, don't just clap because I asked you to clap. But do I have any grateful folk in the house? Come on, do I have any true worshipers in the house this morning? The Bible say that who he has set free, they are free indeed. So I do I have any free folk in the house this morning? God, we thank you this morning. We thank you for a brand new day filled with brand new grace and a brand new mercy. God, it was not our alarm clocks nor our cell phones that woke us up, but Lord, it was your holy breath that you breathe into our nostrils so that we can live out another day filled with purpose. God, we come together in this beautiful place to worship and honor a beautiful God. God, on today, America is observing her freedom. But God, we know that it wasn't guns and bombs that set us free. It was by your holy, precious blood that you shed over 2,000 years ago. It was your blood that broke the, cap the captives free. It was the blood that broke the chains off our life. It was the blood that made us be more than conquerors. It was the blood that healed our bodies when we were sick. It was the blood that kept our families whole. It was the blood that held us in the moments we were terrified. God, it was your blood that we are vic victors instead of victims. So we honor you today, God. We bless your holy name today, God. We just say thank you for the sacrifice that you made, giving your only begotten son so that we may dwell with you for eternity. We ask today, Lord God, that you will release your sweet spirit in this place, that you will meet the needs of your people right where they are, that every seat will be anointed, that every seat, Lord God, will be a, a, an answered prayer today. You know what your children are going through. You know the tears that they cry at night. You know this because you catch every teardrop from their eyes. And you tell them, Lord God, that our tears will not be wasted. For weeping may endure for a night, but we know that joy coming in the morning. So we thank you for the joy. We thank you for the daybreak. We thank you for the midnight hours. Because we know, God, that when you are with us in our darkest hour, you will be with us in our triumph hours. We thank you for your victory today, God. Have your way in this place. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's children shout, Amen. Come on and put those hands together. Come on, if you love God. If you're under shame this morning. If you know that he's your redeemer. If you know he's your healer. Your provider. We now give you over to the best music ministry on this side of heaven, Rose Hill Music Ministry. Be blessed. Ooh, hallelujah. Come on, keep those hands together. Come on, keep the praise going. Hallelujah. Come on, aren't you excited to give God all your praise? Come on, are you excited to give God every praise? Come on, are you excited to get up and get out your seat and lift your voice? Give God the praise that's due unto him. Hallelujah. I know I am because I thank him for all that he has done. Thank you, God.
anybody grateful that he died for your sins? So you could be free. So I could be free. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
lifted me. Oh, love, lifted me. When nothing else could help, it was your love that lifted me. Excited to be here in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm from Baton Rouge, but I, I wore your Browns just for you. I thought if I wore my Saints gear, you might not listen to me, so I made sure I put the Browns on. But I just want to say I am downright honored to be here. I want you to take a moment to appreciate your pastor and first lady, Doctors R.A. and Lady Victory Vernon. Come on, put your hands together. They've been so gracious and so kind to me and to my wife and our church family. We honor them every opportunity we can. And that's my hope and prayer is that you honor them every chance you get. Amen? Amen. Well, listen, did anybody come for a word? Oh, come on. Yeah, that's your cute phrase. Did you come for a word? Well, my wife and I bring you greetings from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We pastor a church called Rose Hill Church. And here's what I want you to know. I'm a son of the house, which means that I'm really a member of the Word Church. So don't treat me like a stranger, all right? Just for a moment, grab your Bibles. We're going to the Word. Every time I turn around, he's making a way. Turn to Mark chapter number 11, the gospel according to Mark chapter number 11, verses 20 through 22. Mark chapter 11, verses 20 through 22. The Bible says, as they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. And being reminded, Peter said to him, watch it, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. I want you to see this. Watch this. Peter says to him, Jesus, Almost like he's surprised. The fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus thought it was so important. He said to them, have faith in God. 
Just for a few minutes, I want to speak from the subject, have faith in God. Grab your seats. It was the 13th century poet, Rami, that said, and I quote, this being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes to us as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if there are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thoughts, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Family, this poem is prolific and powerful because it points to the fact that it's not only important but necessary to master our emotions. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere. This whole concept of emotional mastery speaks to the fact that you and I are so aligned with God that we are so grounded in word and prayer that we can entertain emotions that break many people down, but will, we will use for our own betterment. Now watch this. Many people think handling your emotions means keeping your emotions at bay. It means putting them under the rug. But the truth of the matter is, if we are going to grow, we must invite all of our feelings in. We must analyze them. We must scrutinize them. We must, we must learn from them and we must discern from them why we keep having these thoughts and emotions. If you keep sweeping them under the rug, they will never serve you. But if you invite them in and ask some questions of them, then those emotions that break a lot of people down have the potential to serve you in a way that many things can't. Now watch this. We got to begin to ask questions like, why am I always angry? Why am I always frustrated? Why am I always tired? Why is it that I always feel like I'm not enough? That God can't do a work through me, that he can use everybody except me. Why am I always experiencing these negative feelings and emotions? Where did they come from? What trauma did I experience that brought those things into my life? And how can I move past these things? Because for so many years in the church, we dressed ourselves up and we try to dress over our sadness and shout over our anger and speak over our defeats. But the truth of the matter is, until we fold back the covers and really look at our circumstance and situation the way it is and look at how I'm feeling and be honest about how I'm feeling and wonder why am I feeling the way I'm feeling and what caused it and trace it back to the root cause, then and only then can we have progress. Watch this, I'm going somewhere. No, watch this. The reason why we must do that is because it's hard to perform higher than your self-assessment of yourself. You'll never perform on a high level but have a low opinion of yourself. And if you do perform on a high level, it'll only last for a limited time before it all comes crashing down because ultimately you will live at the level of your own self-assessment. And everybody who's sitting here today, you've got to be honest with yourself. How do I feel about myself? Do I like myself? Am I happy with myself? 
what's going on on the inside of me because what's going on on the inside of me is only coming out and my outward portrait is only an outward portrait of my inward reality and if I want to change my outward I must first begin with my inward but if I'm afraid to look at what's inside I can never change what's outside I don't know who I came to talk to but I came to talk to somebody that if I'm going to change I got to be honest Can I give you some Bible for it? James chapter number one, verses two through four. Message Bible says this. Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so that you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. In other words, it says when we have tests, when we have challenges, when we have trials, those trials force our faith life out into the open so that we can see what we're really dealing with because many of us are saying that we're faith walkers, but we're really faith talkers. And when we go through trials and tribulations, it puts our faith on front street so we can make an accurate assessment of how far we have really come. Watch it. It lets us know another thing that's very important. It lets us know that emotional mastery is a major part of what we call having faith. Because if you can't control your emotions, then you can't really walk in faith. Faith is not just belief, but the ability to manage our emotions and believe to the point of action, even in the midst of the vicissitudes of life. Faith is the ability to hold on to my beliefs, watch this, and act on my beliefs, even when life is up and down and in and out. And things don't look good. When I was writing this, I was reminded of Matthew chapter number 14. The Bible says that Jesus fed the 5,000 and put the disciples in the boat, sent them away. He went into the mountain to pray. They got caught up in a storm. Jesus comes out of the mountain and walks on the water and catches up to them. They don't know who Jesus is. And finally, when they realize who he is, Peter says, Lord, if that's you, let me come. Jesus preaches the most profound sermon ever with one word. He simply says, come. Watch this, everybody. It's profound because he's saying that if you're a faith walker, it will all show when you are able and willing to step out of a boat that other people are not willing to get out of. But the thing that I love about the text is it really shows this storm. I I think the storm can be a metaphor for all of our emotions and how our emotions can be running wild. And even though they're running wild, we can still obey the voice of the master if we're steadfast in faith. And watch this. He gets out on the water and he walks on it just like Jesus does, which means that if I can control my emotions to the point where I can obey God in circumstances and situations, I can walk on what other people sink in. And the thing that really shows that you have faith is that you have the ability to walk on what other people keep sinking in. Touch your neighbor and say, I'm a... Watch this. I didn't come to preach that. Watch this. Here it is. Jesus is an emotional master. He's mastered his emotions because in Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 2, he sends the disciples to get a coat because they're about to eat the Passover meal. And he goes, they go to get a coat that has never been ridden. Can I just throw something in parenthetically? If Jesus can have a coat that's never been ridden, why can't you have a car that's never been driven? I'm just saying. Verses 7 through 9, I'm jaywalking. They bring the coat back and they take their coats and put their coats on the coat and put Jesus on the coat and they lay their coats down and they lay palms down and Jesus rides triumphantly into Jerusalem and everybody's shouting, Hosanna! And watch this. It's easy to control your emotions when everybody's shouting, Hosanna. (laughs) 
But the question is, how good are you when they're no longer shouting Hosanna, but crucify him? Can you still have the same amount of faith? The Bible says Jesus reaches the temple. He goes in and looks around and sees the activities, but doesn't address them. Goes back to Bethany. Then Mark 11, 12 through 14 right here says, on the next day when they had left Bethany, he became hungry. Seeing from a distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for the figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. This is good. Heavy question though. Jesus wakes up. He's in Bethany. On his way back to Jerusalem, he's hungry. So he sees a fig tree. Now, I researched fig trees, and before the Passover, normally fig trees didn't bloom. But this fig tree was fast. So Jesus, seeing leaves, since you fast, says, let me see if you got fruit. Are you just a fast talker, or are you a producer? Watch it. Watch it. And the Bible says when he checked, all he saw was leaves. That's a heavy question. If somebody inventoried your life, would they see fruit or leaves? But the thing that blew my mind was, the Bible says Jesus was angry, but it wasn't fig season. So I'm thinking, how could he be angry at the tree when it's not even the season? Which I think that there's really a deeper meaning in the text, and this is just my thoughts on it, is that Jesus is saying, watch this, that a person who has faith doesn't have to wait for seasons. You can be fruitful when people say it ain't even your season. Look at your neighbor and say, watch this, when God speaks a word to me, I'll create my own season. I don't need to wait for your seasons to be fruitful. I'll be fruitful when the Lord gives me the word. When the Lord gives me the word, it's my time to be fruitful regardless of whether you think it's my season or not. Because sometimes when you go forward, people will say, it's not your time. It's not your time to determine when my time is. If God says it's my time, then it's my time. Oh, I don't know who I came to preach to today, but I need somebody in this same you're ready to jump up and say, you know what? I'm going to make my own season. I'm not going to wait for your permission. I'm not going to wait for your embellishment. I'm not going to wait for your pat on the back. If God said go, I'm... Watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it. Why, why is it that every time you want to do something new in your life, you got to wait till Monday? If God give you a revelation on Sunday... Everybody's going to say, God gave me a revelation. When are you starting? I'm starting Monday. Because people have told you Monday is your new season. Are you waiting till the new year? Why do I have to wait till a new year if I got a new revelation? If God gave me a new revelation, I can make a new year in the middle of the year. I don't have to wait till Monday. I can make a new season on a Wednesday. I got to go. Watch this. If I had time, I would preach all of it, but I don't. Around verse 15 through 17, he goes in and he throws the money exchangers out. He says, you've turned this place into a den of thieves. This is supposed to be a house of prayer. They were doing deceitful things in the church. If I had time, I would tell you all the things that they were doing. And when he throws them out, it looks like he's out of control as it relates to his emotions. But can I help you? When you address foolishness in your life, that doesn't mean you're out of control. It might mean you're in control because they got a lot of people who got a lot of foolishness that they haven't addressed. And you got people doing things in your house that you haven't addressed yet. And if somebody addresses them, then you say, he's emotional. No, I'm not emotional. I'm not gonna let this happen. 
Look at your neighbor and say, not in my house, not, not in my house. Not in my house, not in my house. If you're going to live in my house, you're going to buy by my rules. If you're going to live in... Look at your neighbor tell me, even at work, I'm going to teach you how to treat me. You're not going to just treat me any kind of way. I'm going to teach you how to treat me. Don't just handle me however you think. <laughs> but watch this. I'm trying to get to verse 24. As they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered. It's our opening statement. Let me paraphrase. Peter says, Jesus... Wow, the tree actually withered. <laughs> Jesus says, in so many words, are you surprised? Let me tell all y'all the secret. Let me tell the whole word church the secret. Have faith in God. But here's the heavy question. Do we really understand what having faith in God means? Is it just cliche? Is it church language? When I worked in corporate America, we had things that called, we called buzzwords. And they taught us never to use buzzwords when we were with customers because they didn't understand it. And that's why a lot of people don't like coming to church because we use a lot of buzzwords, stuff that they don't understand. And the truth is, it has become cliche for many of us because we say it, but it hadn't changed us. In 23, he talks about speaking to the mountain and believing. 24 is where I want to park for a moment, though. He says, therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have, that you have received them and they will be granted to you. Watch this. Past perfect tense. Have believed. You, you, he says, believe. May, you you have to believe, then you get. But you want to get, then believe. The first thing it shows, can I teach you a little bit? Let me see my time, I'm good. The first thing it shows is this. Whenever you make a request of God, there will always be a time gap. There will always be a gap between the requesting and the reaping. And it's that gap that gives most of us our problems. Because the gap means that I have to wait to see the manifestation and I'm simply living on a promise. So a gap is, this is where I am this is the promise. And the problem is, I keep saying the promise is mine, but I haven't seen movement. And if it's a day or two days or two weeks or four weeks or a year, then I begin to wonder if the promise is really mine. Here's a, can I help you? I'm gonna talk about two gaps. The first gap, Watch this. Between where you are and where you want to be, it's called the growth gap. It exists primarily for two reasons. Number one, for discernment. Because sometimes when you make a declaration of what you want, you don't even really know if that's what you need. So sometimes you got to get along with God for a season and get on your knees and really begin to ask God, God, is this what you really want for me? Is this the man for me? Is this the house for me? Is this the job for me? Because the problem I'm finding is with people and faith is this. Oftentimes they say they have faith and they're walking around the wall of Jericho, but they're walking around the wrong wall. Somebody, somebody's walking around somebody else's husband trying to get him. You walk around somebody else's job trying to get it. Walking around somebody else's house trying to get it. Walking around somebody else's ministry trying to get it. Walking around. 
Before I talk about I'm living on faith, I got to be sure what God promised me because what's for me is for me. I don't want your stuff, don't need your stuff. All I need to do is be clear on what God promised me. And if I'm clear on what God promised me, then I can have faith to fill the gap. But the next part of the gap is this. I call it the growth gap because watch this. Everybody says it's time to go to another level. But the problem is you don't go to new levels. You grow to new levels. So once God has identified where he wants you to grow, now he puts you in school and tells you to grow to the new level. No, we want to shout to the new level. No, grow to the new level. Watch this. Plants are only moved to bigger pots when they outgrow the pot they're in. You only transplant a pot when it gets too big for the pot that it's in. If you want to see some miracles in your life, get too big for your pot. Get too big for your pot. Overflow your pot. Be hanging all over your pot so that somebody says, I got to move. God says, I got to get them in a bigger pot. Can I help you? My, my son, he, he's now 18. But when he was younger, um, my brother's over there, Elder Donaldson, his, 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 his uh, brother and sister-in-law gave my son some really nice clothes from their son. And, uh, and they were name brand. They were really nice, really nice. And nothing wrong with hand-me-downs if they're still in good shape. <laughs> These kids just going to outgrow them, I'm just saying. And so, but they were really nice, really nice, but they were too big. They were too big. And so my wife and I had this little dilemma. We said, so what are we going to do? I said, my wife said, it's easy. We're just going to hang him in the back of his closet and wait for him to grow into him. Now watch this. He didn't even know anything about it. It was back there in the back of his closet. He was walking around the blessing, close to the blessing, next to the blessing. And there are many people in the room right now, you've been walking around the blessing. You are close to the blessing. You didn't even know it, but God hung it in the back of your spiritual closet. And God was just waiting for you to grow up so that you could grow into your new blessing. And while you're complaining about the blessings that you don't have, God says, I got blessings hanging in the closet for you if you would just simply grow up. It's for growth and preparation. But watch this. Well, how do I shorten that gap, Pastor? It's easy to shorten that gap. The way you shorten that gap is by embracing the reverse gap. Yeah. Well, Pastor, what's the reverse gap? The reverse gap is where I am right now compared to where I used to be. <laughs> See, a lot of people can't shout because they're only looking at where they have not gone yet. But they're not considering where they have been. They're thinking about what God hasn't done, but they're not considering what God has already done. Oh, watch this. You got to have, here's how you have joy. You got to have goals. You got to have things that you're striving for, but you cannot connect your happiness to those goals. You cannot connect your joy to those goals because goals are ever moving. As soon as you get this goal, you're going to have a new goal, which means that you're going to move your happiness and you're going to move your joy and you're never going to be happy and you're never going to experience joy. Well, how do I experience joy, Pastor? When I look back over my life and see all that God has done for me and say, I may not be who I I want to be and I may not be where I want to be but when I look back five years ago I thank God that I'm not who I used to be five years ago I thank God I'm not who I used to be two years ago oh, come on somebody I don't have a building but I got a car five years ago I was on the bus come here somebody I don't have a mansion but I got a house three years ago I was in a one-bedroom efficiency come here somebody I'm not married yet but at least people looking at me I I just came to ask you a question. I came to ask you a question. Has God done anything in your life that's worth celebrating already? If God doesn't do another thing in your life, has he done enough for you to celebrate him right now? I dare you to take 10 seconds right where you are, throw your hands up, throw your head back and say, Lord, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for where you brought me from. God, I'm grateful for what you've done in my life. Lord, I'm grateful for all the manifold blessings that you brought in my life.
Watch this, I'm moving. But, 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 but you think you're broke and somebody thinks you're rich. Somebody would trade places with you right now because they think you're rich. Because when they look at their situation, watch it. Paul says this, and I'm moving. Paul says in Philippians 4 and 11, he says, Now that I speak from need, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am. In other words, Paul says, I've learned to have joy and not connect that joy to my goals, which means I remain in a status of joy. You ain't married yet? You ain't married yet? No, but I got joy. You still got that same car? Yep, it's still running. Thank God it's still running. It could have stopped three years ago. I got joy. And if I appreciate this one, God will give me another one. Here it is. Watch this. I'm moving. Gratefulness is the seed for more. If you can't sow the seed of gratefulness where you are, then you'll never get more. If you can't appreciate what you have right now, You looking at a mega marriage and having maximized. Watch this. Come, come on. So Jesus begins to teach, watch this, on the law of expectancy. 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 Why do you keep saying that, Pastor? Because most people don't live by the law of expectancy, they live by the law of hope and wish. And what many people call faith is not faith, it's wishful thinking and hopefulness. I hope I get a promotion. I hope I start a business. I hope I get married. I wish I had a better house. I wish I had a more understanding spouse. I wish I had more opportunities. Watch this. I deserve better. I deserve that promotion. But here's the problem. You don't always get what you deserve, but you do get what you expect. You're only sitting in that seat this morning because you expected to be here. You didn't hope to be here or wish to be here. You expected to be here, and your expectations pushed you past limitations. Somebody here right now, you had some limitations. You had some reasons not to come. You had some reasons that you could have stayed home for. You had some things to pop up, but your expectancy pushed you past your limitations and got you here because you had expectations. And the same expectation, watch this, in life would push you past those limitations that keep holding you back. Watch it. Really, there are three parts to expectancy. Well, I'll, I'll add two parts so that you understand the whole of expectancy. Number one is desire. Jesus says, when you pray, believe. What are you believing for? There has to first be a desire. There has to be a desire. And the thing about desire is, desire is often birthed out of disaster. It's often birthed out of dysfunction. It's often burst out of debacle. In other words, when I get to the bottom and realize, you know what, I don't want this anymore, then desire rises up on the inside of me and says, I gotta, I gotta do better. I gotta have more. I gotta be a better provider. I gotta be a better father. I gotta be a better husband. I gotta be a better Christian. It's oftentimes when we hit rock bottom that new desires are birthed. So don't curse the rock at the bottom if Christ is the rock at the bottom. That turns your calamity into a catalyst. Somebody needs to say, thank you, Jesus, for turning my calamity into my catalyst. At one time, I I, I just thought it was bringing me down, but when I flipped it around and looked at it from a different perspective, watch this. Here's here. Let me show you something. I I, got to get out of here. Y'all tired of me yet? Can I show you something? If this was a block, if this was a block, same block, 
I could walk up to it and hit it and trip and it would be a stumbling block. But if I looked at it differently, I could walk up to it and use it as a step to go higher. Same block, different perspective. Y'all, y'all, not, y'all not hearing me. And watch this, there's some things in your life that you're calling stumbling blocks that are not stumbling blocks. You just need to look at it from a different perspective and realize that what you were calling a stumbling block might be your stepping stone. I'm sorry, Pastor, I didn't mean to step on your speaker. Ah. Here, here, two ways we learn quickly, two ways we learn. We learn through suffering and we learn through revelation. You don't, learn, you don't learn a whole lot on the mountaintop. You learn a lot in the valley. You learn through suffering. But watch this. Smart people say, you know what? I don't want to learn the rest of my life through suffering. So I want to get to a point where I can get revelation. So that God can just give me revelation and understanding so that I don't have to keep going through difficult seasons to understand. Now watch this. The problem is desire is often dwarfed by doubt and that doubt comes from what I see or don't see. What do you mean? Somebody sees an obstacle right now that's causing doubt that's killing your desire. And then somebody, watch this, doesn't see what they think they need that's causing doubt that's killing their desire. So it doesn't matter if you're tripping on what you see as an obstacle or what you don't see as a resource, both will kill your desire. Well, pastor, can you help me? I can help you. Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number three. Well, let's start at one says, now faith is the certainty of things hoped for, the proof of things not seen. For by it, people of old gained approval. By faith we understand, watch this, that the worlds were framed, uh, that the world has been created by the word of God so that what is seen has not been made out of things which are visible. So he says what we see was not made from things which are visible. So here's my question to all of you faith walkers. If what you see was not made from things that are visible and the invisible is greater than the visible, why are you tripping on what you see or or what you don't see? God is greater than both. Watch this. I'm moving. I must first have desire, then I must have belief. 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 There's several components of belief I want to show you. Number one, you got to believe that it's possible. If you don't believe that it's possible, you can do all types of things and it still won't work. Number two, here's a heaven when it's on the board. I want you to see it. You have to believe that you're deserving of it. Somebody in here, you don't have a spouse because you don't think you deserve one. You haven't gotten a promotion because deep down inside, you don't even think you deserve it. Ooh, got quiet in this Christian church. (laughs) Number three, I must believe it's coming. And watch this. Number four, I must believe that I am enough for God to bring it through. Oh, you ought to clap right there. Somebody raise your hand and say, I'm enough, I'm enough. I'm enough. Sometimes God will give you a vision that's so big that you'll wonder if you're big enough to handle the vision that God gave you. And every now and then you got to get in the mirror and remind yourself that I am enough to do what God said I can do. I am enough to have what God said I can have. I'm enough to become who God said I can become. Every now and then I get in my mirror and preach to Danny Donaldson and say, you are enough. I know the vision is big, but you are enough. Dr. Vernon's preaching on Sunday would be so much greater if you would preach to yourself Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And walk in here already preached up, ready for a word on, on Sunday. Now watch this. Expectancy. Let me explain this. Jesus says, when you pray, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. When you pray. Which means that when you pray and God shows you what it is he wants to do, 
for you, to you, through you, that even though nothing has changed, you should. When you leave out of prayer, you shouldn't leave the same. Because essentially when you leave out of prayer, you came in, watch this, single, but you left pregnant. And the thing about a baby is, when it's small, you, can't, you don't even know it's there. And then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but it takes nine months to birth the baby. And watch this, sometimes when we leave out a prayer, if it doesn't happen immediately, we have an abortion. Watch it, I'm closing. But the woman with the issue of blood, when she touched Jesus, she expected to be healed. Yeah. He says, she says, if I but touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be made whole. And when she touched it, what she knew became reality. Because, watch this, she had already received it before she touched him. Blind Bartimaeus sitting by the roadside. Son of David, have mercy on me. If I had time to preach that, here's what you have to understand. When he says, son of David, he's saying, I understand who you are. He's using legalistic language that says, I know that you're the Messiah. I know you have the ability to heal me. I believe it. I believe I'm deserving of it. I believe it's coming. Yeah, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. Son of David! Sometimes you're letting people quiet your voice when you know you have the right to scream for what you ought to scream for. Somebody ought to jump up and say, I'm tired of you telling me to sit down and be quiet. No, it's my new season. I'm making a new season in my life. I'm making a new determination in my life. I'm going after it. This is my only chance. Blind Bartimaeus said, I don't know if I'll ever see him again. This is my opportunity. He says, send him here. Watch this. Then the people who tried to quiet him had to say, oh, he's calling for you. He gets, what do you want? I want to see. Which means, really, he saw before he could see. Which means that if you're sick, you got to say, you know what? How would it feel if I was healthy? If you're broke, you ought to be walking around saying, how would I feel if I was rich? If you're lonely, you ought to be saying, how would I feel if I had somebody? I want to feel like that now because that's the only way I can receive. And here's the funny thing. Let me give you some science behind the Bible. Science called the law of resonance. The law of resonance means that your outer world will always line up with your inner world. So if your inward world changes, then your outward world has to change to depict the change in your inward world. So when people say, my life is not changing, then don't worry about the outside. Check the... Because if the inside changes, the outside has to change. <clears throat> All right. And then finally, faith is action. You got to do something. I'm closing. You got to do something. Y'all can get ready. I'm, I'm about to go. You got to do something. I'm going to give you an example and I'm going. <clears throat> I got to do something. That means that if God told me to do something, if God told me to start a ministry, and I don't have the resources to start a ministry, I don't have money for a building, but I might have mic money. What do you mean? Maybe I can go buy a mic. The mic says, God, I have faith for the building, <clears throat> even though I don't have money for the building. It means that I took a step. If God promised me a house, well, maybe I'll go buy a knife set that I can't use anywhere else. I don't have money for the house, but the knife set's going in the house when the house comes, and the knife set is proof that I believe that God is faithful. Let me give you a Bible for it. 
Three kings in the wilderness in the Old Testament. Three kings in the wilderness. They wage war and they go out there and they run out of resources. They have no water for their horses, for their men. And they're arguing with each other saying, what should we do? One of them says, let's go to the prophet and ask the prophet what we should do. They go to the prophet and the prophet says this. The prophet says, you need water? Go out in the field and dig ditches. And then here's what the prophet says. He says, it's not going to rain though. So if you dig ditches and sit around and wait for the traditional way of blessing to happen, you're going to miss it. Somebody, you get that on the way home. Some of you have been sitting around waiting for the traditional way to happen. When God can bless you in a million ways by tomorrow morning. And the Bible says that the ditch is filled up from below. And they had plenty of water for the men and the horses and everybody. It was an overflow, but it was an act of obedience that was counter-logical. Didn't make sense. But God said, this is what you should do. And they did it and they saw the result of it. So as I close today, God sent me to Cleveland to say, have faith in God. Watch this. In the midst of a pandemic, have faith in God. When people are losing their jobs, have faith in God. When all types of stuff are going on, Pastor, in Afghanistan, I I have faith in God. 